Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar where we cover um, all sorts of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Um, the show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We can record the show every week, and then it is posted to our website, and I'll show you where you can get all of our, see our archives at the end of today's show. Um, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, neighbors, family, colleagues, anyone you think may be interested in any of our topics. Uh, Encompass Live, this is the beginning of the 10th year of Encompass Live, so we do have a lot of archives, so I'll warn you right away, if you do go back and look at some of our old shows, um, you will find some um, outdated information, perhaps, some old info, um, but um, everything is dated, so you will know when these sessions were actually presented, but we, we are librarians, so we do save everything, it's archives, it's archiving for historical purposes, so um, keep that in mind, we are looking at our um, archives. Uh, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, interviews, book reviews, demos, mini training sessions. Really our only criteria is that it is something library related, something libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing, um, programs and services that we offer here through the Nebraska Library Commission to libraries in our state, um, and um, things that libraries are doing everywhere. We bring in guest speakers. Well, sometimes we have commission staff and sometimes we have guest speakers from um, elsewhere in Nebraska or elsewhere in the country. Um, so we have a little bit of everything here on the show. Uh, this morning we have a mixture of presenters, guests and commission staff. Um, right next to me is Holly Wolf, who is here from the Nebraska Library Commission. And over next to her is Tom Rolfes, who is from the Edu um, Nebraska Information Technology Commission. So two commissions, yeah. Um, and together, they and a few other staff here at the commission and at um, the Information Technology Commission have been working on um, a, pro a project um, that we're going to talk to you about today. Um, Nebraska Schools and Libraries Breaking the Ice and Igniting Internet Relationships. Um, it's a pretty uh, big project we're working on. Good opportunity for some libraries and schools in the state to get involved. And um, I'll just hand over to you guys to take it over and tell us tell everybody about what we've been doing and what they might be able to do. Well, thank you, Krista. Um, and so Tom and I are here just to uh, provide you with an overview of um, a grant that uh, we submitted, a proposal that we submitted for funding uh, last week. and. Um, we're excited about this opportunity, and so today we'd like to tell you a little bit about the opportunity and how we came up, up with this idea and why we think it fits well for our rural communities, uh, schools, and li public libraries uh, to work in a partnership. And um, we're hoping that uh, you'll take an opportunity to take a look at the application and consider this as something that you can bring back as a, a library, public library director or staff and visit with your public school district and um, move forward with this opportunity. So anyway, a little bit more about the opportunity and about us. Again, um, Chris has already indicated where we come from, uh, Tom and I, and um, the, I'm excited about this because this is a, a joint project that we're doing with the OCIO office. And um, it's just fun to work within the state system and try to make collaborative collaboration and resources and knowledge to work together. And the amount that we're uh, seeking out here, I know that sometimes if you look at our library commission grants, we have some pretty hefty ones. Oh, yeah. This one in particular not so is big. not so big. It's only $25,000, but I think as um, we explain more about it, you'll understand um, where this is coming from. And I think it's kind of a unique idea and appreciate the support of the IMLS to try out some new things um, related to collaboration and, and coming up with a new kind of uh, uh, ability to offer a new practice for libraries working, uh, public libraries working in all across the country. So uh, the funding request comes from the National Leadership Grant for Libraries um, and it's anchor institutions and it's called, uh, the category is called Sparks Grant. And so if you're looking at the, um, 
PowerPoint here, it talks a little bit about what the Sparks Grant is, which is more, of, again, it's an innovative type of uh, idea that we're testing out here. And so we're getting a little bit of money and we're getting a brief amount of time, <laughs> really, to try to to try this out and see, will this work or not? And so it's a prototype. More yeah. of a proof of concept. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so we're, we're looking forward to trying this out. Um, and um, so again, we're, we're looking for uh, some communities that are interested in doing this. And uh, in particular, we have five public libraries and public school districts. We're looking to see if they are interested and providing faster internet at the public library. So the some of the, the ideas for why we're addressing this, and, and you may be familiar with this yourself in your own community, is that uh, there are a large number, um, it says 88.5 of our, uh, for our libraries are ranking in the uh, third amongst the all states for small and rural libraries. And so the definition for that is uh, coming out of IMLS and it's for uh, service areas. So that, that does indicate we only have a, a handful of six or so public libraries that it would be considered larger than that in our state. Right, and the service areas of, uh, of 25,000 or less population served right. is what they consider small rural. Right. And so we're also looking here um, at some of the survey data that we've collected from the public libraries in 2016, and it indicates that um, that over 80% of Nebraska public libraries um, have a service level that's below 25 megabits down and 30 megabits up for um, for a standard that they have in their library. And the broadband standard, right, Tom, at this point in time is considered by the FCC to be that 25. Correct, Holly. That's uh actually a residential standard. So an individual's home, 25 meg down, three meg up, would qualify by definition as being broadband. So when we look at the public library, there's there's a lot more, you know, people yeah, you in don't there. Want to use your residential standards <laughs> no. for your public library. Right. We've got way more use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what we've realized is that even attaining that bar for all of our libraries would be a significant achievement mm -hmm. and being yes. the new minimum. <clears throat> so uh, We'll introduce you to yet another commission. The Nebraska Public Service Commission uh, compiles data of broadband availability and also subscription uh, around Nebraska. And we know that somewhere in the vicinity of 17% of all of our households do not have broadband that meet that definition. And then many of these underserved households are located in the state's rural areas. And we didn't write it here, but it's an additional statistic that would translate into almost 50,000 public school students who go home without significant yeah. internet. So that uh, helped provide the basis for why we wanted to do this grant. And then we also see that in, in most cases in the, these communities, and you may be very much aware of this too, that the only community internet uh, Wi-Fi access uh, that's free is at the public library and so again you know we know that we see vehicles parked out in the mm -hmm. parking lot and people that stop into the library that are traveling but also yeah uh, oftentimes if uh, we have in particular school-age kids who after school need to find a place to go to do something that they are often at the library whether they're doing uh, academics or they're just uh, chilling with their friends you know it's, it is the place that they go to and Again, as we spoke before, the speeds are, are not at a level that can uh, provide the, you know, for what the community needs during certain times of the day. And then the restriction we have with, the, with public libraries is the fact that there's a limited amount of funds and can you afford to pay for faster internet? And so that's another uh, focus area for us for a challenge. So, uh, from a high level, I want to insert something here when we talk about this slide. Uh, we know that every Nebraska public school district is connected by fiber. We know that they have a tremendous amount of internet uh, for their own use, but they also are in a position to share that if they were incentivized with other 
uh, community anchor institutions, particularly libraries, because they both participate in the E-rate program. So that's a tremendous asset that Nebraska has that not every state does. But on the flip side, you look at our libraries across the state, over 250, and many of them are at a very uh, modest internet speed, but yet they serve the entire community. So if there was any way where we could get the two community anchors to work together and share in the fiber assets of the school, we thought that would be a good thing. Now, granted, we'd love fiber to every household in Nebraska, and we'd love fiber optics to every library in Nebraska, but we also know that that's not a tomorrow's reality. And so we pro propose this grant as an interim solution to help communities and also to incentivize our community anchors to work together. So any of you on today's program who also have had children in school or uh, you come face to face with kids daily, you know that their daily curriculum in school is becoming more and more digital. They're expected to uh, take content home or access content while at home to complete their homework. And in many of these cases, uh, they don't have sufficient internet access in order to do that. And many of these devices are actually owned and issued by the school. The one-to-one, -one, yes. Exactly. And so we know there's over 100,000 of those devices just in Nebraska that are going home with students, and that's very significant. So now the term in quotes there is homework app. So they go home, they have a, a internet connected device but no internet, what should they do? Well, they go off and resourcefully to anywhere they can to get internet. Might be a family member inside the municipality. They, they go to the library. It may be a restaurant or a coffee shop that also offers internet. So they're without, and if they don't have removable media to take home, and many of these devices do not accommodate, they have to get internet one way or another. <clears throat> so we're thinking and propose that if the internet from the school could be dropped into the library, not only would it be a great demonstration project, but it could be speeds uh, many times faster than what the library currently has through their internet service provider. This is something I actually, um, another um, thing that kids need access to the internet for, and this mm -hmm. just came up when we had here on uh, snow days. Um, we had um, blizzard warning here in, in, um, in Lincoln this early this week. And I had seen in other areas of the country, some people commenting online, um, the parents about a, um, even though it's a snow day, that doesn't mean no learning. And the school's are actually setting they call it digital learning day. If you can't come to school, here's some things online you can do with your kids just to keep, rather than just sitting around doing nothing during the day, they still learn. So they need a connection for that too, to keep going even when it's a, a day off from school for some reason. Correct. That's already, good. Like, the schools are setting up those programs on purpose for this kind of a backup. That's a perfect observation, Krista. About 20% of our Nebraska school districts use learning management systems as a 24 seven strategy in order to meet their uh, learning outcomes. But we don't have a single learning management system statewide and many districts have not yet engaged in it as a deliberate uh, strategy. And so some do, um, but districts are just, just falling short of being able to send kids home with the same exact learning opportunities. But that time is coming. And so the faster we get there, the more internet uh, will be needed and it will become even more critical. So we talk here about um, are there opportunities for collaboration between schools and libraries? We think there are, certainly that they both can participate in E-rate, but also they both have a, a learning instructional and information mission. And students often turn to the library as their place away from home and away from school to uh, to conduct their learning, uh, particularly in small groups. So it, when we're looking at this and talking again, we know that mm -hmm. oftentimes it was stated that the library is uh, the only place for free Wi-Fi access in many rural communities. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea here is that um, 
that you, we want to think about uh, the free Wi-Fi access is available at all times when the school is closed would be our model. Uh, potentially, I guess it would have to be an agreement with the school and with the library, but definitely after school to have the ability to to use a separate network to be able to have students and staff from the school district to be able to log on. Um, but we know that many of the libraries would not have adequate speed to service both the student population and the patrons in the community. And this may be another reason why potentially that sometimes we don't have to see students in some libraries because they've gone there and they don't they can't get the speed that they need to be able to do that work. So they, they are turning to alternative places to do that. Um, and maybe even waiting till if they have a situation where their parents work in another community, they have to wait there to be picked up and they may not even be able to work on their homework necessarily at the library, but they go home and potentially they can, but by then it's after supper, it's late. You know, the mind isn't thinking homework anymore. So mm -hmm. that's one thing that I, I think would be um, an advantageous with the, the funding and, and the setup that we're talking about for this grant. Um, so, and again, we know that the speed is generally not met in the community itself, maybe even in the residential area, it's not available. And so when we talk about putting the school, school and the library mm -hmm. partnership in, we know that the school district already has a, a at least that and much faster internet available to be provided to students during the day and hopefully potentially with this grant at the library and after hours or other hours that they agree upon. So it could improve the public access to the internet and because when somebody comes into the library and they want to use the computers if that they're being used by students that are in there on the same network instead of on a school network that's been brought into the library, you will find that uh, you know your internet um, uh, speeds will be way down and diminished. And also the idea is that you could save money with this project. Exactly. On one of the earlier slides, we mentioned Network Nebraska. And anyone on today's program can go to www.networknebraska.net and find out more about the statewide network that serves all public school districts in Nebraska. It's probably lesser known that our statutory obligation or mission is to meet the demand of state government, local government, which includes libraries, as well as educational entities as defined and by definition, that's public and private K-12 and public and private higher ed. So we could directly serve libraries uh, through Network Nebraska um, but we find that if they work together at a community basis with their school district, uh, their on-ramp to Network Nebraska would be less expensive and uh, ultimately could save money by their connection. So Network Nebraska's mission is faster internet, greater reliability, and lower costs. And we try to do that in every connection uh, that, we, uh, that we make with any of our community anchors. So here we are, we're now at the point where we're going to be talking a little bit about what it is we want to do. <laughs> We've given you some background and the reasons why we think this is a, a good idea and um, we wanted to see if we could get some support for financial support to try this out. So we're looking at an innovative partnership between the public school district and the public library and we want to increase the availability, uh, availability and the quality of the internet access. And we're look at the Sparks Grant, which is a maximum amount of $25,000, which is what we're seeking funding for. And we'd like to incentivize uh, a rural school district and their rural library in a community to work together to increase the speed of the library using fixed wireless technology. And if you're going, whoa, you don't know what that is, <laughs> wait a few minutes and we'll, um, we'll have an explanation on that also. Exactly. And what we propose to IMLS is that we're not going to immediately replace the internet that the library has, but instead we're going to augment. By that, we mean that the public school district's internet would be shared with the library as an additional network at, we wrote, as minimum 25 meg three, three meg up and 25 meg down. <clears throat> but in reality, the internet speeds at the school district 
could be replicated over fixed wireless at almost any speed. And we'll make that to be a local decision. So if, if the district wants to share 50 meg of internet, uh, that wouldn't be a problem. If they wanted to share 100 meg of internet, that wouldn't be a problem over the technology we're proposing. So I'll reemphasize the current internet service provider relationship would stay in place and we would drop in an additional network uh, with the most current standards that could be used by any K-12 student or any staff member who have access to the public school network. So, so our goal mm -hmm. would be to create at least one supervised hotspot in each of the public libraries. And it would be available for that school district's K through 12 students and in particular, this slide is an indicator and staff to be able to come in and use that when it's available to work on their homework that they would be accessing it through their authentication that they have with the school district. Um, and that would be something that would show up as a network uh, for in the library as Tom was talking about it's an augmented or a secondary network. So when a patron would come in, they would see your current library network and then they would see another network, which would be the school network. But that would only be accessible to the K through 12 students and staff because there would need to be a logon authentication uh, for the school in order to get to it. And so this would be happening, of course, outside of the school. And that's what's exciting is that the students, once they leave the school, they can still work on their homework or access the internet uh, to do research or whatever it is they need to do. The school um, technology allows them to do, um, they could be doing it in the library. Uh, and then also this would free up some of the existing usage of the internet by students who are in the library. Uh, they would be able to have that available to more of the community patrons to use. So in the afternoon hours, you might find um, adults or young children who generally say, oh, I can't do anything in there. Those kids are in there. <laughs> and they, they would at least be able to come in and also um, uh, access the internet and, and more, more often than they may be now because they would have a speed available to them. So as Holly mentioned, uh, fixed wireless could be a new term for many of our uh, library staff. So here we've inserted a slide to try to give you a picture of what we're talking about. Uh, the grant would pay for at least two antenna to be placed on the roof of the library and of the closest school through a line of sight. And we call this fixed wireless and it usually travels uh, with a radio signal often called microwave. And as long as these two antenna can see each other without trees or obstruction by buildings, or if they could relay off of a water tower grain elevator, uh, they're capable of incredible bandwidth. Uh, some of these wireless connections around the United States travel up to 25 miles and several hundred megabits of speed. And so that's what we're proposing in order to do a uh, very quick, very inexpensive or affordable technology it would be paid for by the grant and then uh, emanate back to the school district for internet and then be received by the library uh, and terminate in either a wireless router or a wireless access point as well as a wired connection uh, to two desktop computers uh, brand new that the grant would pay for and be resident within the library. So we want to uh, reemphasize here that fixed wireless is not Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi would happen once the wireless or wired connection is terminated in the library, then it would create Wi-Fi within the library. But the actual connection is, is wired or wireless, excuse me. So the next slide here shows you a kind of a pictorial image of what we're proposing. The public school district is connected to Network Nebraska, and that's where its internet comes from. And so we would use a fixed wireless connection and drop a part of the school's network into the library, uh, shown as the blue ellipse. But the actual ISP internet in the red, <coughs> excuse me, red rectangle would stay in place. 
So we would actually have a network within a network. And uh, as Holly mentioned, a school district student coming in with their smartphone uh, would be able to see both the library connection as well as a district connection. And then they would authenticate back to the public school while sitting in the library. So we look here, and this is really our proposed schedule of um, activities and what will be happening in the, in the, uh, the, during the grant period. And the grant period is for just one year. And this is one of the reasons why we are asking for applications ahead of time. We're actually doing some work on this and, and putting our, positioning ourselves to be hitting the ground running May 1 with our five communities already identified and to begin our work. I just want to uh, mention to you, we, if you see over on the, on the right uh, side, there's this phase one and phase two um, is on the left side there. These, this is the indication of pretty much phase one is what we will be getting done within our year. And the phase two optional is more of an area for what, what we hope once you experience the high speed in your community from the, library, from the school to the library, that you will consider making a more permanent um, um, uh, augmentation, not an augmentation, it could still be an augmentation, I guess. For right. more, but So let's uh, kind of frame this from the beginning, and I don't know if we mentioned when will IMLS well, is this a grant award? <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. Well, I expect it to be here, <laughs> but be in April. Sometime in April, we'll get the the we'll grant. Know. And like I said, in the, and we will have already identified the five communities that we're going to be working right. with. And go ahead. Ben. So the whole application process we're talking about today that's being launched with applications due March 9th. We're doing all this in preparation as if we will receive the grant, right. but we don't know that yet. Right now, yeah. So this is all only all, all hinges on if we right, if we receive yeah. the grant or well, not. The one thing I'd like to say, and and the effort of everybody that's been engaged in it, we did we did. There's a two two step process to this, and we did pass right. the first step of uh, of submission, um, which is a, the proposal on uh, was it five pages or three pages? Right, with that very sure positive and encouraging. Yes, right. Pages. So we're, we and are we're excited. Invited to submit the full proposal, proposal. Which, the full grant app, which was last, last Tuesday, Tuesday we submitted it, and it is a, a bit. It's a it's a a lot of effort. So yeah. um, we we um, and the both agencies I think feel very strongly that this is a, a very good idea, and we would like to see it at least get a, a nod for trying it at a, at a small scale. Yeah, so what's not on this slide is that uh, applications are out today. They're due on March 9th. They'll be reviewed and prioritized mm -hmm. so that by the funding notification in April, we'll already know uh, preferably which five district uh, library combinations that we hope to work with. And then uh, by May, we will be boots on the ground at each of the five communities to start meeting and to actually be breaking the ice between schools and libraries that have never likely shared infrastructure or internet before. This will be a brand new relationship. Uh, we'll equip you with uh, a media package that you can send to local newspapers. And we'll also do a statewide news release. And then uh, immediately in May and June, uh, the Nebraska Library Commission with the 25,000 will purchase the equipment on behalf of the library and the school, the fixed wireless equipment, the desktop computers, and then we're ready for installation in the summer months, July and August. And then by uh, August and September at the start of school, the library would be able to conduct an open house, announcing their local project and inviting students and staff in uh, to reach their high-speed internet. And then what we'd ask is uh, <clears throat> you begin to collect data about the number of student and staff patrons that will visit the library uh, throughout the entire year, but particularly between then and winter months because an optional phase two may start. And do you want to elaborate? Um, well, that we have stuff on that, that future slide. Yeah, right. true. Right. Yeah, we'll but, talk well, about yeah. The, yeah. the other piece of this is, um, you know, one of there. There's some things that we would like 
we are you will agree to do and one of them is to working with mm -hmm. and to making sure you in, engage in uh, library e-rate training you may have had it in the past you may have had it recently but part of what we're asking um, each library to do is participate in that and that would be um, Krista's area as mm -hmm. our e-rate e coordinator for the Correct. library commission right and so she would be working with you mm -hmm. with the training and um, don't it would not be anything new necessarily unless you make a decision to go uh, forward with a partnership with the school. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're probably more engaged with the mini consortium <laughs> yep. entity members if you want to talk a little bit about that. And so we didn't put any retraining category one and two, but both would be involved. And for the first time, many libraries will see the newest standard wireless equipment 802.11ac, which is being used in almost 100% of our school districts. So it's faster, more, more robust than any previous wireless or Wi-Fi standard. So that also will be part of the demonstration. So when we put optional phase two, we would expect all of our five applicants to get through the Wi-Fi and the wireless equipment interconnect. But to go forward from that, uh, where you would uh, solidify a more permanent relationship with your school district will be entirely optional. Mm -hmm. So we'll explain what it involves, uh, what parts would be played. Uh, you form a mini consortium, but it is not an expectation that all five of the participants will go forward with phase two. Yeah, that's just an option for you to continue with it. You're going to have more costs, and with E rate, you'll be able you can get a discount on those costs, the equipment, anything else you need to do to keep going with this um, the pilot afterwards. And um, that's what I'll do is help you um, get through that, and we will offer specific. I always do training. Um, basic E-rate training every fall, but there will be something specific for the libraries and schools involved in this about joining together on a consortium so that you work together to get this discount. As we said, it's really optional. Exactly. So we'll, we'll be here for you to make get that happen, make that happen. Exactly. And, the, and then the other part of that is, you know, you would actually be working in the community or, or um, you would be um, asking for bids for whatever it is you need for right. that community to move forward for the phase two. And so that's pretty exciting. So uh, if you actually did download the PDF that I had for uh, sent out with the announcement for this, um, this Encompass Live a few days ago, the minimum assurances to apply have been modified slightly and we'll make this available for you to access um, right after um, our Encompass Live is done. I, in fact, if I have an email, I can send it to you and then we'll put it out on our website also so it'll be available. But these are, again, the minimum assurances that the library um, needs to provide and you'll be the lead on this uh, as far as being able to submit an application versus an accredited library. And then the other piece about this is the library has to be um, within five miles of the school district, which is 60 to 70 blocks. And there's, as Tom was talking about when he was talking about the um, wireless um, technology, fixed wireless, fixed wireless technology, uh, the geographic and structural um, impediments between the library rooftop and the school district building rooftop. I don't think we're really going to be asking you to go up on the rooftop, but uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, I think that's Santa's job. That. But I, I think that I think you'll understand that there there'll be ways that you can you can determine whether you're you're in a good situation for that. And I can expand. Yeah. So there are limitations to fixed wire wireless or microwave technologies. They do have to be line of sight. So uh, we know that this solution will not fit every community. Uh, 150 years ago, we were treeless, but because we're also the Nebraska <laughs> Arbor Day okay. Foundation, yes. we have That's lots changing. of trees in our communities. They're wonderful. Uh, but if you were obstructed between the rooftop of the library and the school, and you cannot see a community high point that'd be classified as a water tower or green elevator, common to both rooftops, then you're probably not a candidate for this project. Uh, we could help you with terrestrial interconnections, uh, bid through E-rate and things like that. But this particular project in low cost, affordability and rapid access requires 
uh, line of sight connections between rooftops. So just be aware of that before you get all excited. Or if it's just trees, that's something to consider in your in, in applying. Is there something you're willing to trim? Cut down. <laughs> cut down. <laughs> Doesn't necessarily have to be cut down completely, but trim. You know, figure yeah, out where it is. Please get permission before yes. you do that. Yes, yeah. yeah. we do not put chainsaws in the ground. No, no, but that you know, trees are are modifiable. <laughs> but other things, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the next one, the library is willing to partner with the local school district. Obviously. If they become part of your upstream internet access, uh, we need to forge a new relationship with the school district, and they need to be aware and willing to partner with the library in order to make that happen. As far as the state CIO's office and Network Nebraska is concerned, it's completely permissible, but we cannot require the school district to work with the library. It has to be voluntary. So to that goal, we are, uh, the state CIO Ed Toner will be uh, sending an email to all superintendents in the state, either today or tomorrow, informing them of this grant uh, possibility and letting superintendents know that libraries may be in contact with them uh, to submit a joint application. So that'd be good. It won't be a cold call. Correct. <laughs> so if you if you wait a day, if you're really excited about this, please wait a couple mm -hmm. of days before you visit with your your local district superintendent. What, so yeah. what what do libraries and schools have to come up with in terms of? Well, they have to come up with a few bucks here. <laughs> um, we're looking at the, a cost share uh, between, uh, and the decision is made by the school district in the library of nine hundred and sixty dollars up to nine hundred sixty dollars. And what we're looking to cover with those costs is the cost of the wireless router, as Tom was saying, the, the most current one, the 802.11ac, and, uh, and any type of installation cost. And if there are any access points, we may Correct. also be looking at. And remember, those. these will be an extension of the school network, right. so they'll be uh, uh, very not a much replacement. involved. Yeah. Right? It's not they a want... replacement for what you have. It, yeah. it is definitely a, a separate um, unit and set, separate Wi-Fi. And then any of the uh, cabling that would be required to bring that down into the library and uh, folding table and uh, or a table to be used in four staff uh, chairs, something that maybe you can consolidate in a small area in your library. Oftentimes the small, the libraries that are in rural areas are small to begin with, but this would be where we would have our hotspot set up with the two uh, desktop computers uh, to be used. So we're, again, that would be a $960 cost share and the decision, and you may not need to come up with all that money, again, because you may already have a table sitting around and four chairs, my guess is you may, but if you don't, then we'll need to make sure that we have a, the actual uh, infrastructure for the, the hotspot. Right, as much as anything, this was an estimate to IMLS that there would be local buy-in to this project and that we had to put a dollar amount on the cost share. So that was our estimate for this type of equipment if it was all bought brand new, uh, but that is not a requirement that you buy new equipment. If you have chairs, tables, ethernet cable, uh, and the school had an additional wireless access point, all you need to do is commit it to the project. There would be no new purchases. So just want to make that clear. Right. Do you have a question about the cost? And I think the answer is yes and no. <laughs> is the cost a one-time cost? I guess it would depend this is one time, but it would depend on if you need to continue and do the, the, we, the bottom thing, phase two, right. you know, would yeah. be let's, continuing. A very good, yeah. very good question. So let's talk about that. On the scheduled events, we showed that the grant performance will end in April of 2019. Let's suppose that a school and library like the interrelationship that has been forged, but they don't want to go to a mini consortium status and the homework hotspot is working just fine. They could elect to keep the fixed wireless equipment in place in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And the district continues to share internet there after hours and on weekends. And the library continues to provide this service for area patrons that belong to the school district. Nothing new gets needs to be done. Correct. It just, Nothing and this wrong. equipment that we provide to the schools is yours to keep. Correct. Too. That's the thing that this isn't like a you got to give it back. Right. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. The only condition we put is in uh, optional phase two, 
we would be rebidding a circuit between school and library for a more permanent relationship. And that connection could be copper or fiber uh, exceedingly fast. It would be what we call terrestrial, which means underground, at which point the fixed wireless equipment would no longer be necessary. And we could uh, voluntarily ask for a relocation of that equipment to another school library connection somewhere in the state. So we really, uh, to be quite honest, haven't thought through what would happen with that. But if See a school library for the first year, yeah. Yep. If they wanted to keep it in place and not apply for a mini consortium, there's nothing wrong with that relationship. Uh, it can continue as is until the life end of that equipment. That's a good question. The library um, staff needs to be willing to share their experiences. In particular, we're thinking about um, regional library meetings, um, and or if something comes up uh, across the state that we'd be interested in having you go and uh, provide your story about your library and your school and your community and the impact that this uh, Sparks grant has had um, in, in that way for you. And I believe we're paying for transportation costs for that. Right. <laughs> we aren't expecting you to take that on your own dime, but I think it's very, it'll be very important for it to be the firsthand story that comes out from these communities. Tom and I can go out and talk about it, but I think it, um, it's very impactful. Now, if you're super shy and you, you can't talk, we'll, we'll, we'll set aside and, and visit about that later, but uh, don't make that the, the reason not to apply for this uh, exactly. grant. But, but it is, I think it'll, uh, be a great story to tell, um, and so we would like to keep you and keep that in mind as something that you're you're willing to do, um, yeah. and as an assurance. And then the very last um, bullet here is on the uh, phase two, which is optional. We've been talking about this already. In fact, Tom just mentioned about this doing infrastructure upgrades related to um, after we've completed the grant. And I think for this one, we're talking about a willingness to do this. Um, we're hopeful that we will um, have a, ignited uh, the fire and that you are you are actually willing to take the next step on. And, and our goal in the original, the phase one part of this is to equip you with everything that you need related to E-rate training and any type of resources to be able to move forward with phase two and um, and move on in your community to establish a more permanent uh, uh, connection between the library and the school long term. We do have another question before we go on to this about the school access point. Um, and I think it's a good question. Does the ac school access point have to be the school district building or can it be just any of the schools? Because we're talking about having a partner with the school district. Correct. If it's a multi-building school district, mm -hmm. so they have five buildings, a high school, a middle, and three elementaries, as long as all of them are fiber, mm -hmm. they're part of the school district network. Mm -hmm. So it could be the closest, most accessible school uh, providing its high bandwidth access and part of the district uh, network exactly. Right. So and that might be a question yeah. to figure yeah, it you, out once you're making contact. Right, once you, yeah, I was gonna say, once you work with the school and figure out how is their um, fiber set up through, yeah. through all the buildings, you'd be partnering with the school district because they're the one that runs the internet. But yes, whichever school building happens it's to be close location. enough to you, yeah, you just connect to whichever one of those sure. is, the, is the closest one to what you So we with. have yeah. a couple dozen uh, school buildings in the state that are actually restricted by DSL or cable modem and that's their sole source of internet. They're not part of a full district-wide area network. If that's true, they're not going to be a high bandwidth upstream uh, provider for you. And that's a really good question. Um, it'd be rare to find a school that's not fiber connected, but just understand that they are out there. So very good question. So again, since we've talked about this, you could have multiple um, mm -hmm. uh, school buildings in your community. So this rooftop to rooftop thing is, of course, you know, you're know, you looking at any one of them. Yeah. In a smaller community, you could be small enough that you meet the five mile uh, limits and right. you, just, you just keep looking and find out who's ready to chop their trees. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably not known, but about two thirds of our Nebraska school districts out of 244 reside within a single structure mm -hmm. so that is so common in rural nebraska yeah. a k-12 building uh three actual schools elementary middle and high all within one building uh 
tends to be a two-story or three-story structure, which is an advantage because it means the rooftop is higher, uh, but that is so typical uh, in rural Nebraska if they haven't built a newer school. Uh, in, my, in my community, I live just north of here, and we have uh, we've maintained their two elementary schools in the small communities, and then they have the, the rural school. But my guess is they may not have fiber into the yeah. small communities. So should we turn to the application or uh, the requirements? Sure. I do have one question. I'm just going to respond to you right away because it's an easy answer. Um, uh, well, they want if they've accessed these PowerPoint slides. Yes, um, at, at, afterwards when the recording is available to you, these slides will be posted online as well so that you can see them um, and to, to share them because they want to share it and show it to their school administration. That's great yes. and that was one of the other reasons with the email that I sent out. I have um, attached just the one page abstract and um, also the the application form, which I just mentioned, has changed. It hasn't changed dramatically, but I um, prefer that you wait and take the most current one if you need to share that. Um, I think we understand it's it's somewhat complicated to understand. And these slides so are really good to explain that. They, yes, they, so they explain it, and it helps if you're talking about this. I mean, um, not to make it um, make you nervous about it, but uh, the terminology is really important. So I would encourage you to take the slideshow, this uh, PowerPoint and, and provide it. And also, of course, it'll, this, this will be archived and you will be able to actually see the, our presentation in a few days too, if you wanted to share that as you went through to get more of the, the conversation that went on. So. so now we'll turn to the actual application process, which is available today. Uh, the first bullet says that you demonstrate that the school district and library candidates for fixed wireless technology. And as we mentioned, it must be line of sight. So in the application, you're going to provide a MapQuest or Google Map uh, image or a map that shows uh, the actual distance between your library and the nearest school district building. So that'll be helpful. Um, you may not have to climb up on top of the library roof, uh, but you should certainly know uh, that you're a candidate for a direct line of sight eligibility for the project. Second bullet says you include a letter of support from your school district superintendent. So uh, that is part of the application process. Uh, you'll need to uh, uh, create that relationship or uh, you know, forge that relationship or maybe get the superintendent who you already know to write a letter because they're in agreement with what the grant is asking you to do. So Tom, they'll have to break the ice. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's the point. If the ice is in existence, find a way to break it. And we think it'll be mutually beneficial as a project proceeds. The next one has to do with E-rate training and Krista has talked about that. Uh, the phase two, which is optional, mm -hmm. uh, would require a new build entity number for the school and the library to work together. And uh, that's uh, optional, but it would also make eligible for category one, the wired infrastructure between school and library, which would be a more permanent relationship. And so also, again, we mentioned this before uh, that we're asking for a cost share or, or your you, uh, your 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 skin in it for up to nine hundred and sixty dollars, and that was basically what we had to put into the budget to submit the grant. And we're not sure if that will be the amount of money. So certainly, um, we can as we get closer in, and we're actually you know working with the five communities. I I honestly believe it will change. Um, so, and then complete the uh, application fully by March 9th and submit it to us. That would be our, um, that is our, our, our timeline and our date for submission. Exactly. When you open the application, you'll see other questions about uh, what's your level of B rate participation currently. Um, do you see student usage of the library after school and weekends? And so you'll answer these other uh, informational and demographic questions as part of the application. That concludes our part of the presentation. If you have any questions, continue to type them in. Yeah, if you have any other questions, I'm monitoring here, and I think there was one. Oh, 
someone did want to know if this would be potentially be a grant that would be um, that we would do again in the future. <laughs> Well, that's we're that's still the, trying to get this one done, but well, um, that's the idea yeah. of the Sparks grant, though, is that we, you know, we we've discussed this too. That it's a this is a, a smaller amount of money. But we would certainly be hopeful if it's successful and we see this that we would uh, for sure apply for a larger amount. We should mention that right. uh, this grant concept is already attracting national attention, and there are some folks at the national level who would have urged a much larger and uh, more aggressive yeah they think we're not going far enough yeah that, even for this first trial so yeah. they wanted us to uh, apply for hundreds of thousands of dollars on an untested concept <laughs> so <laughs> that's the point of sparks grant is we're to try out alive. something that's new <laughs> untried and un and somewhat risky in that not everybody would participate or maybe the relationship uh does not there is not going to be as productive as we thought it might. <clears throat> but certainly, if we do have success in the 2018 uh, and 19 grant year, that it could be followed by a much larger, more ambitious uh, grant application to follow. So the, the five communities, or if you're, if, and of course, if you're interested in making an application, um, you're going to be the pioneers. Um, and, you know, as, as Tom's talking about this, I think sometimes it's, um, you know, you, you want to see a little success before you you put your your uh, boots into it, and uh, so so this is why we're asking for a few a few communities to come forward and try this out. We we honestly feel this is a, this is a great partnership that has not been utilized before, and we're really excited about it. So we we know that the internet and um, is basically it has become the foundation in your public library for much of what you can do and what you can offer in your community. And as an anchor institution in your rural, rural community, we want to be able to sustain um, your your position there and sustain the library. Did you want to show you had um, the applicant application? I think you had it up there. Do you want to show that? Yeah. If you just hit escape, you can get out, and then you'd be able to bring it up. The word document mm -hmm. at the bottom. I can't find my mouse. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, if you you did receive this um, as an attachment potentially, and so we just again, this is also very good to take with you as you're visiting about it, uh, so people can understand there's some background information. This will be made available to you if it hasn't already later. Yeah, the the updated one, but yeah, and this is this is the current assurances that we have. This is the only piece that was modified, and then here are the series of questions, and they're all pretty easy to answer. Um, take up as much room as you need. If you feel like you need more space, and go for it. It's a, just a very um, informal, but uh, we do want all the questions answered. And if you need any help with any of these uh, related to your E-rate participation, if you're a new library director, uh, you can call the tech. Uh, yeah, to you yes. or, or listen. Okay, there we go, Krista. I was going <laughs> to volunteer Sam Shaw too, but I guess that would be, we'll go with Krista. I think it'd be great. At least you can introduce yourself to each other. Um, and so a little bit more about uh, what what's happening in your um, school district, if you know about it. You may need to make some inquiries about that also. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Tom? No, but uh, we're getting to the end of our time. Mm -hmm. We want to thank everyone yeah. for joining us today on this program. Uh, we sincerely encourage applications. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that one another place where the, the project timeline is, and, and this would be also nice to be able to take along with you as you're discussing it. So, so we did have an at link on here, so this will be the newer one. We'll update this. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I think if we if if we have your email, if we can find it. I'll go ahead and just send you an email with that application today, also. And they'll probably be as far as those that are um, in the um, state of Nebraska public libraries, or if you want to go to our website, I will have some type of uh, um, announcement about this, probably middle of next week, mm -hmm. after we know that the district superintendents have their exactly. message. Yeah, but anyone who's signed up for this, yeah, we can automatically Great. proactively send that you would be a copy. Fantastic. So you'll, you'll have the we'll most have recent copy um, to, to begin working on. Mm -hmm. And if, if somebody works on it and they didn't have the most recent, it's just basically an insertion of one page that won't have to be modified. 
Well, we really appreciate your taking the time to, to listen to uh, what we're offering as far as the possibility, if our grant is funded, of course. Yes. Your fingers yes. for us. <laughs> but we think it will be. Yes. yes. <laughs> And lots of good questions. Sounds like people are interested, which is yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Definitely. Yeah. All right. So the final slide got our uh, contact information. So right. feel free to follow up. Yep. If you encounter any school district personnel that are inquisitive, uh, please direct them to me, yes. and I can uh, uh, reassure them that this is. Uh, <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> yeah, but this is an okay relationship because it does have E-rate implications up to the highest level of our network. But again, everyone is an eligible entity. So uh, we'd be thrilled to have more libraries either directly or indirectly connected to the state network. Uh, we buy an awful lot of internet every day and we love to be able to share it with other community anchors. So thank you so much for your interest. We'd love to have it. <laughs> yeah. And it's fast. So awesome. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tom and Holly, for sharing that with us. Um, like you said, keep your eyes open. We'll be sending you the, the application for any of you who have signed up here today. So you can take a look at it and um, keep an eye, as, as Holly said, on our website. We'll be actually announcing more about it um, to get even more libraries, hopefully, um, hearing about it and sending applications. We have a lot of good ones to choose from. And, and yes. Send good thoughts about yes, us. I guess one more thing I thought about is one of the reasons why the we we have a full month of February. So if you are going to take action and you're interested in this, one of the big pieces of that is that you if you're having to go before some kind of board meeting or anything mm -hmm. that relates to that in your communities, you want to be sensitive to that and looking at your calendar right now and making sure you get uh, this this uh, item put on the agendas of anything that needs to be done. So that's kind of why we left you the whole month of February to get yourself scheduled, we hope. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone attending. Um, on our Encompass Live website, which you can get to through the Library Commission's page, or also if you just use your um, Google. We are the only thing called that, so <laughs> yay. So Encompass Live, you can find the commissions page or through here. Um, the recording will be available right here. These are our upcoming shows. That is our archives. The most recent ones come at the top, so we will have a link to today's recording. The slides will be available here. The application will be available here. We'll also be emailing you proactively the application form as well. Um, so look for it there. Um, later this afternoon, I'll send out an email to you all so you'll know when the um, recording is available and up there. We should mention if you're new to this concept, there's an archive presentation. The next best thing to having your That's own. That's true. Yes, we did do um, something Internet about this previously. Yeah. Yep. This is one that um, uh, Tom and Holly were here before with a lot more detail about the whole um, how this kind of connection could work before we had actually gotten really into um, getting a, a proof for the grant. So exactly. A little, <laughs> well, I think we were doing both simultaneously. Everything is kind of happening. There's like one slide on this one. Lately. It's like, we're working on this grant. We hope we'll get it, but here's a lot more details. And this this, these, this has a lot of, um, this presentation has a lot more um, like diagrams in it. Yeah. So um, I would say use this one in conjunction with today's presentation together and have a really good representation. It will, it will talk well, about it where you can start and then how you can move forward, you know, to and how you maximize might it. your school district superintendent. Right. It'll give you some suggestions on right. how to break that on. So this session is actually in with today's, they go together. They're, they're part one and part two. We, I would say maybe of yeah. the same project, the same concept. So um, I'll look for that there. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's show and recording. Um, I hope you join us next week. Our topic is the Innovation in Libraries Awesome Foundation Chapter, which sounds it's really cool. Um, this is a um, the Awesome Foundation is a group that does lets any sort of organization set up um, chapters where they can provide grants to any sort of organizations, wh whoever they're involved in. And there is a libraries one about innovation in libraries um, here. So if you are interested in doing something new, prototype something, prototyping something, what we're doing now? <laughs> get related, yeah. Well, we should check that out. <laughs> um, they have grants available on a regular basis. Um, I believe they started just last year. Uh, but don't quote me on that the year before. So um, some people who are involved in that, and these are people at libraries all across the country in groups 
together to provide this um, this uh, chapter of um, providing grants. So sign up for that sec, uh, presentation next week. Um, also, any of our other shows coming up, and Encompass Live is on Facebook. You've got a little like our page here. If you're a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. We post notifications. There's a notice about logging in for today's show. When our recordings are available, any new topics that come up, I post them here. Um, so please do give us a like over there if you are big on Facebook to keep up with us. Other than that, that wraps it up this morning. Thank Thanks, you. Chris. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for attending. Um, and we'll see you next time at Encompass Live. Bye-bye.